Howdy folks, Jamboriki here, and welcome to another video in which I rank a bunch of animated villains. This time, I'm going to be counting down the Pixar villains. Just a heads up before we start though, I relied on polls to decide if certain villains did or didn't count for this list. So, if an antagonist you like isn't in the mix, then you'll have to take it up with democracy, I guess. <laughs> Let's begin! Miles Axelrod from Cars 2 Miles is a rich entrepreneur who schemes to make alternative fuel look bad in the Grand Prix, so that he can rake in high profits from gasoline sales. I won't deny that Miles' stunt is quite an imaginative one. There is some creativity in a villain staging their competition as faulty, while vouching for it as a public activist. All in all is safe. Alternative fuel is safe. There is no way my fuel caused these cars to flame out. Logically though, it makes very little sense that he would throw so much money at an expensive and elaborate worldwide scam. It's not exactly wise business. <laughs> However, it's his twist villain shtick that I dislike the most. Don't get me wrong, I don't think that twist villains are inherently bad. They can be done well, but Miles is quite possibly the worst animated twist villain ever made. The clues for his villainy range from the obvious to the impossible to spot. None of the hints we get find that fine line that keeps audiences guessing. The movie tries to throw us off Miles' scent by making us think that his mad scientist minion Professor Zed is behind everything. But the film tries too hard to mislead us into suspecting him, and then abruptly abandons tricking us once it turns out that Zed has his own boss. Alright then. Oh, and don't get me started on when Miles finally gets exposed. Not only is he shamefully outwitted by dopey comic relief Mater, who has conveniently suddenly become a skilled detective. It was you leaking oil at the party in Japan. You just blamed it on me. Electric cars don't use oil, you twit. Then you're faking it. You didn't convert to no electric. But Miles is the one to out himself in an embarrassing moment of whimpering panic. Look, I get that he's under pressure. There's a bomb involved. But this is supposed to be our ultimate big villain. Where's his maniacal, you'll never catch me moment? Why is he so pitifully easy to defeat? Especially after all the build up. You're insane, you are! Deactivate! Bomb deactivated. Have a nice day, Sir Axelrod. I'd actually say that all of his minions were 10 times more intimidating and far, far, far worthier of being the official bad guy. Miles belongs at the very, very bottom of my list for many good reasons. What a letdown of a villain. Francesco Bernoulli from Cars 2 Francesco is the racing rival of Lightning McQueen in a World Grand Prix, a cartoony Italian stereotype who goes ham on roasting lightning in every race they share. It's very obvious that Pixar were trying to recreate the rivalry between Lightning and Chicks, but this matchup is so artificial. There's nothing natural or organic about this clash of racing egos, because Mater is the one who forces an antagonistic relationship to get going between them, and Lightning finds himself having to live up to it. Not so fast, McQueen! Not so fast. What is that, your new motto? Motto! Questo è il primo volto che vado su questo programma ridiculo! Well, this sounds like something that needs to be settled on the race course. Every time these two get a chance to taunt each other, it comes off as so contrived. The rivals for the sake of being rivals, and both parties labour so much over their back and forth insults. There's nothing entertaining to their squabbling banter. I mean, come on, they're working with the Cars 2 script. Really? Your speed? Then Francesco is triple speed. Francesco is triple speed. He's just too silly to be taken seriously as a major racing antagonist. Which would be fine if he was a good comedy villain, but all of his comedy is limper than a deflated tyre. Lightning McQueen! Buonasera! Um, nice to meet you, Francesco. Yeah, nice to meet you too. You are very good looking. Not as good as I thought, but you're good. Francesco is deservedly regarded as one of the weaker Pixar villains, and I'm pretty sure that many people watching this video forgot that he was even in Cars 2. <laughs> Screenslaver from The Incredibles 2 Screenslaver is a villain who uses hacking technology to interfere with broadcasts, so that he can preach about the superficial nature of media consumption. He has this cool cyberpunk Riddler thing going for him, and his shady mystery draws us into his enigma. Who is this man? Why did he become a supervillain? What's his goal? While technology is his forte, he can put up a good fight against Elastigirl. <laughs> But most fascinating of all, we find ourselves agreeing with his cynicism towards society's green obsession. You don't talk, you watch talk shows. You don't play games, you watch game shows. Travel, relationships, risk. 
Every meaningful experience must be packaged and delivered to you to watch at a distance. Villains are allowed to be right about things sometimes, because it shows how good and evil isn't always black and white, a nuance you rarely ever see in family films. Unfortunately, this very promising villain turns out to be <gasps> a twist. Who are they really? Um, Evelyn, the tech wizard behind Elastigirl's mission? You know, the character who showed no hints of hidden intentions, all while the film tried insultingly hard to desperately convince us that her brother was screen slaver, giving us an offensively on-the-nose red herring. Oh, I know how to get him! My brother? Winched? I, no! Screen slaver! Credit where it's due, her scheme to stage a superhero rebellion is quite the achievement. She's very good at using a technology to direct her own propaganda for the media. Talk. Superheroes have forcibly taken the bridge! Repeat, now. superheroes have- ah! oh. Plus, it is impressive how many superheroes she successfully hypnotizes. But here's the thing, Screen Slaver was already a really compelling and menacing baddie, so imagine the disappointment when it's revealed that he's just a decoy, and our real villain has the personality and design of somebody's cool aunt, who spends about 90% of the film hiding behind a computer screen while telling everyone else to do her dirty work. Oh, and an overwealthy scorned tech genius using gadgets to overthrow superheroes? Come on, we've been there and done that for an Incredibles film. I'm Syndrome, your nemesis in it. The Incredibles 2 really wants to be a feminist movie too, which I'm totally on board with as a feminist myself. But this out of nowhere twist actually results in the film being plagued with old fashioned sexist cliches, like turning the lead female characters against each other and villainizing a woman who dared to be talented at a male dominated job. Look, I enjoy The Incredibles 2 just fine, but some things about it grind my gears, and its villain just so happens to be one of those issues. Zerg from Lightyear. In this Toy Story spin-off movie, Buzz Lightyear is working with Junior Space Rangers to save the timeline he's trapped in. But a mysterious sinister robot keeps chasing after him. It turns out that this cyborg is really a Buzz from another future, who wants to use Buzz's hyperspace time crystal to mess with time. This is another terrible twist villain from Pixar. Sure, Zerg makes for one hell of a dominating mecha, a towering machine that can rival the instincts and skills of a legendary Space Ranger. I mean, Buzz vs Zerg scenes are maybe the only exciting parts of this boring film. My issue is with the twist itself. Look, I get that the film wants to teach Buzz to not obsess over fixing his mistakes. I follow that. But I cannot buy that our lead character is on a path to become this Zerg. Not a single cell in my body believes it. All because this Buzz Lightyear is too squeaky clean. Sure, he can mildly lose his temper with the Junior Rangers. That team! <laughs> Why are you congratulating yourself? But that's it, really. Pixar are way too afraid to put Buzz Lightyear's branding at risk, so there's no effort at hinting a truly dark side to this version of him. That's why the twist doesn't work. Without creative or intelligent foreshadowing, it's just a twist for the sake of a twist to cattle prod the audience into being shocked. A gimmick, if you will. Zerg could have been a clever subversion of villain tradition. The potential was there, but Lightyear completely botched it. Thunderclap from The Good Dinosaur. Thunderclap is a Nyctosaurus who has a weird cult-like obsession with storms because they conveniently sweep up prey like a snack box for him. At first, Thunderclap seems like a nice gentleman who is concerned for victims of storms, but once he snaps up a prey for lunch, it's quite a shocking surprise and raises the stakes big time because now we know that predators in this kid's film will not hold back and Arlo's pet human, Spot, is prime meat to them. <laughs> It's also kind of unnerving how Thunderclap and friends can make an entrance, circling the storm like ocean sharks, ready to pounce on human prey. It's an inventive way of building on our villain storm shtick, while intimidating our heroes at the same time. Now sure, the T-Rexes do beat them pretty easily and effectively frighten them off, so they end up losing a few scary points and become noticeably absent until the finale. However, you have to remember the good dinosaur is about admitting fear while being courageous. I'm done being scared. Who said I'm not scared? But you took on a croc. And I was scared doing it. If you ain't scared of a croc biting you on the face, you ain't alive. And Thunderclap turning out to be all talk does play into that sentiment, because he's a dinosaur who clearly pretends to be brave. Oh, and Thunderclap's loss to the T-Rexes 
thus intensifying aggressive desperation to save face in the climax, making him a very worthy final boss and a great test for Arlo to prove his love for Spot. Thunderclap could have been used a bit more in the film for sure, especially after being hyped up as a serious predatory creature, but he's still a decent obstacle for Arlo and Spot, who happens to tie in decently with the film's themes. The Underminer from The Incredibles movies. At the end of the first Incredibles film, we get teased with a special guest villain called The Underminer. In The Incredibles sequel, we finally have a chance to see this villain in action through an exciting opening scene that shows the family being forced to work together. The Underminer is a very fun villain reminiscent of a 60s Batman baddie. He's got a campy charm that harks back to old fashioned comic book writing. I also love how he's a human who happens to have more like features. That takes creative design work. While he's a short and stubby guy, he does have a fighting chance against the super strength powered Mr. Incredible, making them both worthy foes in combat. The Underminer has no regard for the mayhem that his drill tank causes, seeing all citizens as expendable and buildings as obstacles. All he cares about is stealing his money, which is pretty dang evil for a baddie this silly. The entertainment of this opening scene all comes from the reckless nature of the Underminer and the nail-biting tension of the supers racing fast to halt this humongous beast of a military-grade construction machine. The Underminer might get less screen time than other Incredibles foes, but he still deserves to be an iconic part of the franchise's lore, and it's really great to hear Pixar mascot John Ratzenberger finally getting a chance to dig his teeth into his first ever villain for the company. Behold the Underminer! I am always beneath you, but nothing is beneath me! The only reason why I've not ranked him any higher is because he's kind of a minor villain who doesn't really have much to do with the main stories of both films. Chick Higgs from Cars Chick Higgs is the cocky racing rival of Lightning McQueen in the first Cars movie. On rewatch, I'll admit that he's not as fun to hate as I remember. Sure, he's a rude jerk with an obnoxious personality carried very well by a charismatic Michael Keaton. Hey, Rook, first one to California gets Dynaco all to himself. Ah, no, not me. No, you rock, and you know that. But I just didn't find myself hating him enough to root passionately for his loss at the Piston Cup. If I'm going to be completely frank, as a racing rival, Chick is kind of underwhelming. I mean, his nickname in the race and commentary scene is The Runner-Up, which doesn't exactly paint him as a worthy nemesis for Lightning, and I feel like Pixar were holding back on the spice for his jerkiness. He leans way more to being insecurely pathetic than effectively imposing. Show us the thunder! You want thunder? You want thunder! Kachiga! Kachiga! Hey, that's my beer! Saying all this though, I do think the chick works well symbolically. He represents the worst of Lightning himself, an arrogant and shallow sponsorship-obsessed loser who puts winning before good sportsmanship. In a way, he becomes a ghost of Lightning's former self in the finale, showing audiences who Lightning could have become if he didn't learn anything while in the countryside. Come on, baby, bring it out! Bring out the Piston Cup! Kachika! Kachika! Yeah! Now that's what I'm talking about! Hey, how come the only one celebrating is me, huh? Heck, Chick's presence in the climax is the perfect test for Lightning's growth, because we get to see if McQueen will choose between showing up his rival or dignifying a veteran's last race. You just gave up the piston cut. You know then? Ah, this grumpy old race car now once told me something. It's just an empty car. Chick is one of my less favorite Pixar villains because he is lacking, but I don't think that the film would be the same without him, and Michael Keaton kills it behind the microphone. The Cursed Dragon from Onward. Brothers Ian and Barley are on a quest to find a soul gem to finish resurrecting their father. But the legendary Manticore explains to the boy's mother, Laurel, that the gem will release the dangerous Cursed Dragon. This huge creature is a really exciting and creative obstacle for Onward's finale that imaginatively uses bits of Ian's skull to shape into a dragon, each piece of rubble cleverly sculpted into a uniquely abstract baddie. While it is funny that the school mascot becomes his face, I will admit that the joke does end up kind of making him a little less threatening. However, the Cursed Dragon is very well utilized into the story because it's a physical threat to Ian and Barley's desperate rush to finish the resurrection spell before the sun sets. As Ian puts his wizardry to the test by combining every single spell he's learned throughout the film to his advantage. Bombardia! So 
So the Cursed Dragon has the very, very important role of making Ian's coming of age arc come full circle. But what I like the most about the Cursed Dragon's place in the film is how it inspires the supporting characters of the Manticore and Laurel to become fantasy warriors in their own right. It brings a massive grin to my face to watch a brave mum and a retired mythical legend joining forces to defeat a dang scary dragon. Mordu from Brave. Mordu is a prince who has been transformed into an evil bear, who will sometimes attack Mero during a month throughout their forest adventure. There's a tragedy to a character who let arrogance and hate push him away from his family, only to gradually transform into a monster that represents pure darkness. But this is still our villain, and he could be quite the scary threat at every appearance. Bears are already very intimidating creatures, so intensifying their scariness by 10 and making them relentlessly evil gives us a predator that even nature itself would reject. But Mordu's most important role in the film is to serve as a symbolic mirror to our main characters, a mother and daughter who have let pride and rage push them apart, with said mother slowly turning into the very beast that Mordu is now. Every time we see Mordu, he's a daunting reminder that he is who the queen could morph into if the family don't repair, which is a dark thought when Merida is alone with her mother. Once Mordu is eventually defeated, we get to see the ghost of the prince, who seems to be at peace and thankful for his defeat. This is because he's been trapped in a shell of evil and witnessed the monster he's become, bookending the tragic tale of royalty gone rogue. Johnny Worthington III from Monsters University. Johnny is the smug president of the Raw Omega Raw fraternity at Monsters University. Yes, he's the typical bully jog trope that we've seen in every college comedy, but I would argue that he's an example of the cliche done well. Based on his fancy name, it's very obvious that he comes from a privileged background, hence why he can care freely focus on his social life over deeper scarce studying because daddy will just pay off the school for good grades and he'll get his dream job by the end. While he's savvy enough to invite Sully into Raw Omega Raw based on his surname's legacy, he's also willing to spitefully confiscate James's jacket the instant he poses a threat to his fraternity's glittering reputation. It's just a precaution. Roars are the best scares on campus, Sullivan. Can't have a member getting shown up by a beach ball. <laughs> He's also an elitist who tyrannically dictates which fraternities are worthy on campus. The very moment Uzma Kappa gets a taste of popularity after rising through the ranks in the scare games, Johnny strategically uses his university fame to sneakily team up with the other dorms to humiliate them so that they'll want to quit. He's that cruel and powerful as a student. I want you to stop making us look like fools. Hey, you're making yourselves look like fools. <laughs> Let's be honest, boys. You're never gonna be real scarers because real scarers? Look like us. <laughs> Johnny has become so attached to his social popularity that you could easily argue that it's his soft, tender weakness. Teenagers are very fickle, and Johnny's jock status could be stripped away from him if he ever blunders. Something that Mike wittily points out in the film's most iconic line. After you lose, no one will remember you. Maybe, but when you lose, no one will let you forget it. Johnny might ironically be often ignored in the Pixar rogues gallery because of his more colourful competition, but I think he deserves praise for demonstrating how a character archetype can pay off in a story if written well. Jackson Storm from Cars Free. When Lightning McQueen enters the Florida 500, he goes up against a fresh new racing car called Jackson Storm, who has a huge advantage over McQueen thanks to his youthful energy and advanced engine. I've seen some people sum up Jackson as a cool car with a slick design, but I think that's a shallow take on the character. Mr. Storm certainly does look sleek and polished, but I do not think he's superficially bland. He has this smooth confidence that I personally find very magnetic, being especially talented at dishing backhanded compliments at Lightning, as he pretends to play fanboy while taking sly digs at Lightning's age. It's actually a lot harder than you think to make a burn sound like a praise. Morning champ, how's our living legend today? Uh, 
Still very much alive, thank you. And I would appreciate- you know, I can't believe I get to race the Lightning McQueen <sighs> in his farewell season. What are you talking about? He's also mad skilled at getting into other racers' heads. A bully who knows how to target his victims' insecurities and weaken their confidence in themselves. It's important to look the part. You can't have everyone thinking that you don't deserve to be here. He's trying to get in your head. They don't need to know what you and I already do. That you can play dress up all you want, but you'll never be one of us. As the race dawns closer, the film pushes Lightning lower and lower, humiliating his pride scene by scene, or while the media are supporting his chances of winning at almost zero, and hyping up updates on Jackson Storm's skyrocketing records. This is how you effectively raise the stakes with a racing rival villain. Based on his recent run times and forecasted track temperatures on race day, Storm's chances of winning are 95.2%. That low, huh? <laughs> However, I wouldn't say that his coolness makes him impervious. His Achilles heel is challenging races his own age. When a racer who has a chance against him enters the track, we see a more vulnerable and scared side to him. Oh, I don't think so. No! Cruz, get out of there! He's only really confident when going after low hanging fruit like lightning. To me, Jackson is the best Cars villain. Heck, I think he's the Cars racing rival formula perfected. A genuine enemy for our hero who can talk trash while letting his talent speak for itself. Gabby Gabby from Toy Story 4. Gabby is an old-fashioned doll who came into the world with a defective voice box, but when she meets Woody the Cowboy, who has a working voice box from her exact era, she's very eager to have it from him. Gabby Gabby is undeniably charming as a doll, a cute little toy with good manners, a sweet smile, and a gentle voice. We were just out for my early morning stroll, and look, <laughs> we met you. My name is Gabby Gabby, and this is my very good friend, Benson. Oh, uh, Woody, pleasure to meet you. Even though she's meant to be the film's antagonist, we do actually feel sorry for her loneliness and pain, wishing that she had a voice box to attract the attention of Harmony, a little girl who frequents the antique shop, or while Gabby is tormented daily by the book that came with her that demonstrates her purpose. When my voice box is fixed, I'll finally get my chance. Yeah, Gabby Gabby is not exactly a naturally intimidating villain, but she has that creep factor that all vintage dolls unintentionally have. Oh, and her minions, the ventriloquist dummies, make for horrifying sidekicks, each compensating for Gabby's low threat. Stay quiet. You better hope the dummies didn't. Oh! I wouldn't say that Gabby is traditionally evil, but rather socially stunted and morally misguided most likely from her lack of playtime with kids and other toys. It's only when she stops trying to force Woody to surrender his voice box and actually has a one-to-one -one mature chat with Woody. All I want is a chance for just one of those moments. That she finally gets what she wants. This is where my praise for Gabby stops though, I'm afraid. You see, once Harmony rejects Gabby, the movie fails to give her time to process her serious grief, as Woody rushes her into trying to befriend another child right away. Look, I get that the film wants to close off Woody's arc of moving on to helping toys find owners. It's a natural step forward for his character. But it all comes at the cost of fast-forwarding Gabby's journey, who could have come to accept that a voice box doesn't define her worth, projecting imaginary friendships onto strangers can lead to disappointment, and that she isn't any less of a toy if she doesn't have an owner. Gabby Gabby is one of the only things I actually liked about Toy Story 4, but even she's not without her faults, and her ending always disappoints me on every viewing. Ecole from Luca. Ecole is the local bully of the quaint Italian seaside town of Porto Rosso, who enters an annual children's multi-sports competition every year, despite being a grown man. He's exactly what a low-stakes slice-of-life movie like Luca needed. Someone who crudely takes advantage of his age to feel more athletically superior to a bunch of children. Oops, school, oh, can't you wanna you never even made it to the downhill. As an audience, we've become super invested in our hero's chances in the contest, and really, really, really want them to win their Vespa, so we can have a lot of fun sneering and hissing at their arrogant man-child of a rival, and get a kick out of whenever Luca and his friends dunk on him. Here's a new one. You look like a... a, a, a catfish. A catfish! Huh? 
<laughs> uh, they're bottom feeders, and they also have two sad little whiskers. <gasps> <laughs> as pathetic as he is, though, I would not say that he poses zero threat, because he can be a very aggressive bully who won't go light on hurting kids. And he's the only villager who clues in on the chance that Luca and his mate Alberto are sea monsters. Come on, let's go. No, something's fishy with you two. I mean, besides the smell, <laughs> you're hiding something. So he's not just a sports rival for our heroes. He's also someone who is ready to kill at the chance for a higher level of local fame. Something he must be desperately craving as a loser who only excels at beating kids at cycling. You should have left when I told you. Now, I gotta kill some sea monsters! Ernesto de la Cruz from Coco. When little boy Miguel ends up in the land of the dead, he teams up with a guy called Hector to find his supposed great-grandfather, famous musician Ernesto de la Cruz. But it turns out that Ernesto was the one who killed Hector so that he could steal Hector's songs and become a major celebrity. As a twist villain, I can't really say that Ernesto's true intentions were well foreshadowed. Sure, there's a line that hints at his lack of talent. Greatest eyebrows of all time, maybe, but his music? Eh, not so much. <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about but I don't really remember any clues that Leaky's secret is a murderer, and there's far more development for Ernesto's wholesome legacy. You could also criticise his actions before his big reveal as being too noble or caring for a supposed villain, but we should expect a narcissist to sweep at chances to look like a hero and a loving granddad in front of an adoring crowd of gushing fans. My great-great-grandson is alive and a musician to boot. However, what I like about Ernesto is that he's a fable for the seedy and dark side of the music industry, a culture renowned for normalizing plagiarism and crime while putting talents on godlike pedestals. Just like the people of Mexico, we as an audience only know Ernesto the celebrity, and Miguel's fanboy passion sucks us into this glamorized version of him. It was up to me to reach for that dream, grab it tight, and make, make it come it true. true. Only for the twist to strip away the illusion and remind us that celebrities can be different people behind the stage. Success doesn't come for free, Miguel. You have to be willing to do whatever it takes to seize your moment. It's a lesson that more people need to take in because we need to be wary of the fact that celebrities can put on acts for interviews and perfect reputations can be built on well-marketed lies. As a villain, Ernesto is aggressively dangerous. I mean, he had the egotistical guts to proudly depict how he murdered his best friend in one of his own films. And he's not afraid to throw a small, helpless child off a building. All to protect his fake legacy. No! No! Though, you could also suggest that these are the things that cause him to lose. His impulsive need to protect his golden reputation, coupled with a history of getting away with murder, make him too stupidly arrogant to consider exposure. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're halfway through this video, and I would just like to let folks know that I have a Patreon, a website where you can give monthly supportive donations to creators in return for awesome rewards. Feel free to become one of my patrons today. Lotso from Toy Story 3. Lotso is a cuddly teddy bear who leads the sunny daycare community, but he's actually a fascist dictator behind the scenes, who forces Andy's toys to suffer at the hands of the daycare's destructive toddlers. Lotso is first introduced as a really inviting character. From his southern drawl to his strawberry-scented aroma, this guy seems like the grandpa of the daycare. I thought I heard new voices. Welcome to Sunnyside, folks. I'm Lotso Hugging Bear, but please call me Lotso. It's his appealing charms that sway us from distrusting him, but we also get little hints here and there that this daycare is hiding a secret. This is how you set up a good twist villain. Lotso might seem cute, but he's a force you wouldn't want to mess with. His authoritarian command over all the toys makes him a fearful presence. Plus, he's backed up by the daycare's strongest and toughest toys. His desperate cling to power comes from serious abandonment issues as a toy. But we can't totally sympathize with him, because Lotto has created a propaganda story to leech sympathy from his fellow toys. I don't know what you're talking about. Daisy? You used to do everything with her? Yeah, then she threw us out. No. She lost you. She replaced us. She replaced you. That's the thing. Like all fascist leaders, he doesn't actually care about his people. He just sees them all as soldiers in his regime, or mindless loyalists he can vent his anger towards. It's this selfishness that ultimately causes his empire to fall. Push him in, all of them. <gasps> this is what happens when you dummies try to think. We're all just trash, waiting to be thrown away. That's all a toy is. <laughs> Hey, stop it! Put me down, you idiot! Ah! 
As much as I like Lotso as a villain though, I've been getting a sense of deja vu from him lately. Doesn't he remind you of Stinky Pete from Toy Story 2? A friendly, charming toy who tricks our heroes into trusting him, only to betray them, and reveals himself as a villain who is desperate for love and attention, even at the cost of making other toys suffer. Lotto also gets a nostalgia-filtered flashback that shows that he was once abandoned by his owner, and this made him lose hope in ever being domesticated again, just like Jesse's backstory in Toy Story 2. Look, I'm not sure how intentional these rehashes were, because I don't know what happened in the creative room at Pixar, but these deja vus kind of make me want to dock originality points from Lotso's character. Despite this, I still think that he's one of the better executed Pixar twist villains. Sid from Toy Story. Sid is a nasty bully who destroys and mutilates innocent toys for fun. You could argue that he doesn't know any better as a young child who isn't aware that toys are alive. But Sid does exhibit early signs of a serial killer to me. From a lack of empathy to a strange, weird obsession over torture. Patient is... Brett. No one's ever attempted a double bypass brain transplant before. A lot of this maybe stems from having neglectful parents who haven't taught him right from wrong. The film is fantastic at introducing him at the very start, this serious menace who relishes in toy death. So when Woody and Buzz become his prisoners, we're immediately frightened for them, because we know that this bratty punk has no remorse for toys. Our fear is the audience is raised to 11 once we're in Sid's bedroom, which acts as his evil lair slash torture dungeon. A dark, dank, messy hellhole where toys are mutated into tragic experiments. Each one showing what kind of hybrid creation that Woody and Buzz could be surgically turned into. <gasps> Sid never actually ends up mutating our heroes, but the further he takes his demented idea of playtime games, the more we want Woody and Buzz to escape, which makes every failed attempt to get out all the more soul-destroying to watch. There's no place like home! There's no place like home! There's no place like home! <sighs> as far as we know, Sid does go on to live a happy, healthy life as a humble garbage man. So maybe Woody's plan prevented another serial killer in the making. We toys can see everything. So play nice. Dean Hardscrabble from Monsters University. In the film, Hardscrabble agrees to let Mike and Sully back into her scaring program if they can win the scare games. Hardscrabble might just be a teacher, but she's a really straight one who takes pleasure from intimidating her students and crushing their dreams with harsh truths. She commands herself with a regal academic authority that's bound to send shivers down every monster on her program. I'm so sorry. It was an accident. What? This? My one souvenir from a lifetime of scaring? While she might seem unaffected by Mike and Sully's accidental damage of a trophy, I get the impression that she's offended deep down, hence why she takes things very personally with them both. That is a shadow approach with a crackle holler. Demonstrate. Stop. Thank you. But I didn't get to- I've seen enough. Which is arguably unprofessional. Then again, it's also a little improper for her to go as far as to make a wager with a student to protect her ego. However, that's what makes her such a compelling character. Seeing her break a serious teaching role to immaturely torn to mock Mike and Sully. <gasps> Don't look so surprised, Mr. Wazowski. It would have taken a miracle. But it's her own surprising development that stands out the most to me. Watching her become genuinely stunned when Mike and Sully prove themselves is exactly what we've been waiting for. Here's this stern-faced and cold Dean, who's been unimpressed throughout the whole film, suddenly realising that she kicked out the best scarers in university history, and dang is it satisfying to see her acknowledge their talent. The two of you did something together that no one has ever done before. You surprised me. Al from Toy Story 2. Al is a grubby toy collector who steals Andy's Woody for his eclectic Woody's Roundup collection, which he plans to sell off to a Japanese toy museum for big, big bucks. Being the only human Toy Story movie villain makes Al already very imposing from a toy's eyes, because to them, he's a powerful god-sized giant, and our plastic heroes have no choice but to submit to his will. Some of the most tense moments in Toy Story 2 involve a pint-sized toy having to outwit the large Al at the risk of toy kind being exposed.
while he has no malice towards the toys, because he doesn't know that they're really alive, there is something very sick and twisted about the fact he stole a child's toy for profit. Who does that? Heck, who says that he didn't steal everything else in his Woody's Roundup collection? Anyone who is willing to feed from a literal child is bound to have no morals whatsoever. Al is also the antithesis of the Toy Story franchise's spirit and message, too. A toy owner who doesn't treasure the affectionate value of toys. Even though he owns a toy store, he doesn't seem to appreciate toys for fun, only taking pleasure from the money that toys can make. <laughs> you, my little cowboy friend, are gonna make me big bucks. <laughs> Al is an iconic Toy Story villain who slides perfectly into what Toy Story 2 is all about, made all the more entertaining thanks to the voice of underrated character actor Wayne Knight. Imagine we added another zero to the price, huh? <laughs> what? Yes! Yes! You got a deal! Skinner from Ratatouille. Skinner is the bad-tempered head chef of Gusto's, who reluctantly hires a bumbling man called Linguini, only for Linguini to turn out to be a talented cook himself, and the descendant of Gusto. However, Skinner is onto Linguini's secret little chef. The fun of Skinner as a comedic villain all comes down to his oversensitive nature, and how easy it is to wind him up. He's a fantastic parody of real-life egocentric chefs who can't control their temper in the kitchen and try to overcompensate for their insecurities. It's so dang hilarious watching him lose his mind over Linguini's secret, because his anger and anxiety can reach cartoony levels, and voice actor Ian Holm gives him a ridiculously over-the-top French accent that's impossible to not laugh at. Oh, I see the theatricality of it. A rat appears on the boy's first night. I order him to kill it. And now he wants me to see it everywhere. Ooh! Ooh, it's here! No, it isn't. It's here! Am I seeing things? Am I crazy? Is there a phantom rat or is there not? But oh, no. I refuse to be sucked into his little game. At the same time, though, Skinner resembles the sleazy side of catering because he treasures Gusto's marketing potential way more than living up to his legacy. Skinner has built an entire empire on the grave of a legend without any shame at all, plus grumbles at Gusto's belief that anyone can cook. He's a sellout weasel who oozes with sliminess and stinks of self-interest. Gusto's already has a face, and it's fat and lovable and familiar, and it sells burritos! Millions and millions of burritos! After the film has spent ages engrossing the audience into Remy's passion for food, and captivating us with Gusto's touching words of inspiration, it's not hard for us to root for Skinner's downfall as a villain, because everything he does is an offensive insult to the film's message. But I also like that Skinner's defeat isn't a simple knockout with a clean bookend. Even after becoming a washed-up ex-head chef, he still tries pathetically hard to get revenge on Gusto's, and becomes just as much of an effective threat to the restaurant as food critic Anton Ego in the finale, thus doubling the tension in the already hyped-up climax. Skinner is a peak comedic villain to me, the gold standard of how to make a funny animated antagonist. Stop that soup! <laughs> no! Hopper from A Bug's Life. Hopper is a grasshopper who forces an island of ants to surrender their harvest to his swarm every year, under the serious threat of violence. I've actually forgotten how scary Hopper is for a kid's movie villain. Pixar somehow made a brittle insect into one menacing baddie. You little termites! I give you a second chance, and this is all I get! A nasty villain who has no shame in tormenting children, or threatening to feed them to his insane pet. You don't like Thumper? <laughs> Hopper is more than just intimidating, though. He's intellectually strategic, too. You see, his annual harvest theft isn't really about grasshopper economics. No, it's about power. Hopper wants to spitefully traumatize these ants, strike them with fear, so that they'll never rise up to the grasshoppers. It's quite disturbing how much anxiety these ants go through under the thumb of Hopper. <laughs> It? But there's gotta be more food on the island. If we give up any more, we'll starve. Hopper won't accept this! When a braver ant called Flake stands up to Hopper, the grasshoppers just laugh it off. But Hopper sees the long-term danger of ignoring such a rebellion. He knows to not simply wave off a red flag, no matter how small. You let one ant stand up to us, then they all might stand up. Those puny little ants outnumber us a hundred to one. And if they ever figure that out, 
There goes our way of life. But I do have to say that Hopper's weaknesses are just as interesting as his strengths. Flaws that add texture to his character and make him more than just a mean grasshopper. Like the only reason he won't kill his bumbling useless brother is out of respect to his mother's deathbed. So he's actually quite the mama's boy deep down. Oh, and when Flake's circus friends turn up as a distraction during the finale, Hopper shows that he has a soft spot for violent slapstick. And it's his dark sense of humor that stops him from suspecting anything. However, it's his own trauma over birds that's his biggest weakness. A genuine phobia brought on by an attack that physically scarred him. Whenever a bird appears, real or fake, Hopper suddenly drops his intimidation act and turns into quivering jelly. Oh, and can I just say that Hopper has one of the darkest Pixar animated villain devs ever? I mean, yikes. Charles Munns from Up. Charles is an adventurer who is after a rare species of bird so that he can save his reputation after failing to find said bird many years ago. Carl and Russell's new pet, Kevin, just so happens to be this exact same species. Charles is first introduced as a warm and charming old man, maybe even a potential helpful friend during Carl and Russell's adventure. You sure we're not a bother? I'd hate to impose. No, no, it's a pleasure to have guests. A real treat. It's this misleading intro that makes his heel turn completely catch us off guard as an audience. But it's a twist that makes complete sense. Because the last time we saw Charles, we had a feeling that his career was about to get a bit dark. The instant that Charles learns that our heroes know Kevin, Charles' smile becomes a frown, and he turns into this deranged madman, with his serial killer reveal amping up the uncomfortable atmosphere to a degree that borders on horror. Uh, you're not leaving. We don't want to take advantage of your hospitality. Hey, come on, Russell. Well, we haven't even had dessert yet. Oh, the boy's right. You haven't had dessert. <laughs> Epsilon here makes a delicious cherry's jubilee. Charles is also very, very relevant to the film's sentimental values. You see, Up is all about Carl learning to let go of his past and live more in the moment, while Charles is dedicating the later years of his life to catching a silly bird and has become a secluded hermit who can't trust anybody. Charles is the old man that Carl could age into in his golden years, if he keeps putting his regret before his happiness. Sure, Charles has the company of talking dogs, but they're less pets to him and more like servants. He mainly sees them as useful minions in his crazed desire to capture Kevin, which, to be fair, works really well to his advantage, because they're loyal to their owner, can use their voice boxes to communicate updates, and serve as threatening thugs against Carl and Russell. Heck, they're even willing to sacrifice their own lives for the mission. The film is open to poking fun at Charles' crippling age, but come on, his physical daring feats during action scenes are dang impressive for someone in their 90s. Yet he's not exactly fit as a fiddle, but his unhealthy obsession overpowers his brittle bones and weak lungs. <laughs> Any last words, Fredrickson? Ego from Ratatouille. Anton Ego is the miserable critic who poses as a threat to the restaurant Gusteau's. It's down to Remy the talented cooking rat, who uses his human friend Linguini as a chef puppet to protect Gusteau's reputation from Ego. You could argue that Ego is just doing his job in Ratatouille, but I wouldn't say that he's being a responsible or professional critic, because he doesn't want Gusteau's to succeed, seeing their potential rise back to the top as an insult to his review of them. So there is a malicious bad faith behind his criticism. I haven't reviewed Gusteau's in years. No, sir. My last review condemned it to the tourist trade. Yes, sir. I said, Gusteau has finally found his rightful place in history right alongside another equally famous chef, Monsieur Boyardee. Touché. Ego doesn't hate food. In fact, he loves it. He just feels that modern French cuisine has become uninspired and despises Gusteau's belief that anyone can cook. The salty bitterness has shaped him into a Grinch-like vampiric creature who prowls Paris with a venom tongue and a fancy pen. He's a scary guy with his crooked features, lanky physique, sunken eyes, and bleak fashion sense. When he comes face to face with Linguini before the big day, there's an ice cold tension in the harsh air because he's a legitimately intimidating fellow. Pardon me for interrupting your premature celebration. But I thought it only fair to give you a sporting chance as you are new to this game. 
Uh, game? Yes. However, when Anton finally tries Remy's ratatouille, he's taken all the way back to the roots of his love of food, becoming so speechless that he dramatically drops his beloved pen, which has been his weapon of spite on his tirade, and gobbles up his meal like a hungry child. It's an iconic Pixar moment that shows the depth of Ego's love for food, and how a great meal made with love can emotionally sway even the cruelest of critics. This revelation leads to Ego not only finding new hope in modern cuisine, but also maturely reevaluating what it means to be a good critic, all for a powerful speech that still hits hard to this day. We thrive on negative criticism, which is fun to write and to read. But the bitter truth we critics must face is that in the grand scheme of things, the average piece of junk is probably more meaningful than our criticism designating it so. All in all, Anton Ego is a brilliantly executed redeemable villain who we go from fearing to respecting, to the point where we actually feel happy seeing him smiling by the film's end. Stinky Pete from Toy Story 2. Pete is a box prospector toy from the Woody's Roundup line who totally supports Al's decision to sell the gang off, even if he has to force Woody to come along for the ride. Stinky Pete is an expertly written twist villain, created for the screen long before the trope became overdone. When you first watch the film, you're enamored with this charming old man with a grandpa vibe, but on rewatch, you can read way more into his dialogue and see the red signals. Because really, all of his supposed words of kindness or sympathy yearning are just carefully manipulated attempts at putting doubt or guilt into Woody's head. Each one made to sound like gentle compassion. I was in this yard sale. Yard sale? Why were you in a yard sale if you have an owner? Well, I wasn't supposed to be there. I was trying to save another toy. Was when... it because you're damaged? Hmm? Did this Andy break you? Peter's been pulling the strings all along, all while geniusly hiding behind the alibi of his collector's box having never been opened. It's a box. He's meant in the box! Never! Open. We buy that Peter's been this determined to immortalize himself in a museum too. Jesse makes it very clear that living in our storage is horribly claustrophobic, and Peter's most likely facing the same anxieties. Go! Oh, go on, no, Jesse! No. Jesse, look at me! I promise you'll come out of the box! Now go! Oh, and Peter isn't exactly subtle about how much he despises modern, fancy space toys hogging the cowboy trend. Two words. Sputnik. Once the astronauts went up, Children only wanted to play with space toys. Which foreshadows a major incentive for Pete's villainy. I'll tell you what's not fair. Spending a lifetime on a dime store shelf watching every other toy be sold. Well, finally my waiting has paid off. This is why I ranked him higher than Lotso. There's more sophistication to his scheming and more depth to his emotional suffering. Once Pete outs himself as the baddie, he fully 100% commits to his villain role, embracing his new boxless freedom to become a far more physical threat to Woody as he does everything he can to make sure that the full roundup gang makes the plane to Japan. Yeah! Your choice, Woody. <gasps> You can go to Japan together or in pieces. If he fixed you once, he can fix you again. But it's his voice actor, Kelsey Grammer, who truly makes him memorable, using his buttery voice for Pete's pretend act to win over Woody's trust and the audience. Why, the prodigal son has returned. Then going full sideshow Bob after the twist. Idiots! Children destroy toys! You'll all be ruined! Forgotten! Spending eternity rotting in some landfill! Waternoose from Monsters Inc. Waternoose is the CEO of Monsters Inc., a factory that collects children's screams to power the world of monsters. Waternoose is honestly one of the best Pixar twist villains to me. The movie does an incredible job at building up why Waternoose is desperate to save his company. We've lost 58 doors this week, sir. Oh, kids these days. They just don't get scared like they used to. Monsters Inc. is also a family company that's been passed down through each generation, so there's also that extra pressure of not being the descendant to lose it. James, this company has been in my family for three generations. I would do anything to keep it from going under. Which helps us to buy that he would resort to teaming up with Randall for a sleazy scheme. I'd say that he's a different flavour of villain to Randall though, because he does have genuine respect and admiration for his best scarer. James Sullivan, and is sincerely heartbroken when he banishes him. I never should have trusted you with this. Because of you, I had to banish my top scarer. Ah, with this machine, we won't need scarers. Besides, Sullivan yeah. got what he deserved. Sullivan was twice the scarer you will ever be. 
He's not resorting to this underground conspiracy for fun, but out of a pathetic greed for profits to dig him out of a hole, which makes him an all too real satire on the default nature of every business CEO. I'll kidnap a thousand children before I let this company die, and I'll silence anyone who gets in my way! <laughs> for most of the movie, Henry is committing to the role of a humble boss under stress. But once the cat is out of the bag, we're reminded that he's a legendary scarer who can use his creepy spindly legs to crawl fast. Even in his old age, he's still a frightening monster. Open this door! Open this door! Randall Boggs from Monsters, Inc. Randall is the work rival of Mike and Sully, a monster with camouflage powers who creates a scream-sucking machine for Monsters, Inc. during an energy shortage crisis. This vicious Pixar villain really deserves a chef's kiss for being such a quality baddie, from his slimy and slinky character animation to his unique ability to blend into backgrounds. There's no animated villain quite like him. Straight from the beginning, he's developed as a very competitive workplace bully to Mike and Sully. So there's already a brewing tension bubbling between our heroes heroes and villain, giving a solid incentive for both parties to have a personal grudge against each other before the main story is even started. Attention, we have a new scare leader, Randall Boggs. <laughs> Randall! Oh, 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 Slumber party. <laughs> 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 Randall is not only great at taking advantage of Mike's weak physique to send a message of threat, but he is also willing to take on the big strong Sully, while being totally unfazed by their weight and size differences, because he's so dang confidently skilled at his camo powers and agile sneaking. You don't know how long I've wanted to do that, Sullivan. <laughs> But what makes him truly scary to me is his horrible scream-sucking invention, a nightmarish machine that could be mistaken for a demented saw trap. Look, I know this film has a cutesy reputation, but can we just acknowledge how messed up it is that Randall made this thing without any remorse for children? I also find it compelling seeing Boo going from being terribly traumatized by Randall to ultimately finding the bravery to stand up to a closet monster, all to save her big fluffy friend. What a way to inspire kids watching to face their own fears. <laughs> Randall freaking rocks as a villain to me. He's nasty enough to hate for fun, and effectively creepy as a malevolent monster, plus his jealous rivalry with Sully and Mike creates a really entertaining hero-villain workplace conflict. Auto from Wally. -E. When the captain of a ship holding the last of humanity finds a way to make Earth home again, the system's autopilot, Auto, intervenes with the journey back as part of its mission. Auto remains one of the scariest animated family film villains ever, all because it's a cold machine who can't be reasoned with. A robot that only listens to its own programming. You can't debate or bargain against it. Auto, things have changed. We've got to go back. Sir, orders are do not return to Earth. But life is sustainable now. Look at this plant! Green and growing! It's living proof he was wrong! Irrelevant, Captain. Auto takes obvious design inspiration from 2001's HAL 5000, but Wally -E pushes the concept even further by making Auto far more flexible and mobile. The cyberpunk villain doesn't just have total power over all the ship's controls, it can also be a very physical threat to our humble captain. <laughs> You're not getting away from me when I. <laughs> The decision to cast text-to-speech software Macintalk as Auto removes all and any traits of humanity in their voice, adding to the soullessness of its character. Captain. Sir, I insist you give me the plan. Otto, get out of my way. We cannot go home. What are you talking about? Why not? We've also become very endeared by the captain's curiosity and passion for Earth culture. Plus, we can tell that his mundane job gives him no pleasure or thrill in life. So, of course, we're going to be on Team Captain. Otto's threat to humanity's progress serves as the ultimate incentive for the captain to grow as a hero as well. Not only giving him a reason to fight for his ancestor's home, but also motivating him to walk on his two feet again after years of slacking. <laughs> Ah, Otto, you are relieved of duty.
Otto is one of cinema's quintessential robot villains, and a Pixar rogue who deserves to be high on my list. Before I announce my number one pick, I'd just like to encourage folks to consider subscribing to my channel for more fun and exciting film and animation related content. Cheers folks! Syndrome from the Incredibles Long ago, a little boy called Buddy insisted on being the sidekick to Mr. Incredible aka Bob Parr, but Mr. Incredible rejected the kid. Years have passed, superheroism is now illegal. Bob, who now has a family, misses the good old days, and he's conveniently invited to a mysterious island to work as a superhero. However, it turns out that his boss is actually Buddy, now going by Supervillain Syndrome. Can I just gush over Syndrome's design? Look at it! That wacky ice cream hairdo, his costume's hip black and white colour scheme, those cool gloves, that flashy cape, and those creepy piercing eyes! It's a really original and quirky take on the look of a villain for a superhero movie. In a way, there is a tragedy to a little boy with promising invention skills being turned down by his favourite superhero. However, now that he's an older man, we can no longer sympathise with him, because he can only blame himself for becoming a genocidal murderer. He created the Syndrome character. Zero point energy. Yeah, I, I save the best inventions for myself. Am I good enough now? Sure, Buddy had the potential to be another Iron Man or Batman, thanks to his wealth and talent, but instead, he let his petulant jealousy of supers consume him, going as far as to viciously murder every superhero he can, just so he can have no competition as a sad, pathetic, fake hero. That's the thing, as hard as Syndrome tries to seem fabulous and cool, in reality, he's just a rich, nerdy man-baby who selfishly wants to LARP as a superhero, all while putting innocent lives at risk. <laughs> He doesn't care about the noble responsibility of superheroism, just the glory and fame that comes with it. Even when he's trying to play villainous foe against the Incredibles, he's still geeking out like he's reading one of his comics. As if this nightmare he's creating is just another issue for him. He's that delusional and insane. You, sir, truly are Mr. Incredible. You know, I was right to idolize you. I, I, I always knew you were tough, but tricking the probe by hiding under the bones of another super? Oh, man! I'm still geeking out about it! Syndrome is a genius satire on the childish entitlement and parasocial nature of bad faith superhero fans, as well as testament to the dangers of letting the over wealthy, arrogant, and immature role play as real superheroes for fun and attention. So, those are all my choices. Who is your favourite Pixar villain and why? Let everyone know in the comments below. Plus, don't forget to like and share. Cheerio, folks.